In 1997, I was in middle school and the best movie ever was released. Starship Troopers, an alien war movie with boobs. It instantly became one of my all-time favorites. I've made no attempt to hide the fact that in my younger years, I was a libertarian patriot. So I really took to the message of the movie. So much so that unlike all you fake fans, I actually served. A few years after the movie came out, when I was in college ROTC, I had to write a report about a book which focused on military leadership and tactics. Guess what book I chose? In the decades since the movie was released, Starship Troopers has gathered quite the cult following, especially among white millennial men who have never served a day in their lives. I know that because before I joined up, I was one of them. But then I did serve. And I read the book, and I can pretty confidently say that most fans of the movie probably haven't done either of those things. Nobody seems to understand the message of the book or the movie. So come on, you apes. You want to know better? This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Would you like to know more? The movie directed by Paul Verhoeven and written by Ed Neumeyer was originally titled Bug Hunt at Outpost 9, but eventually changed its name to Starship Troopers to cash in on brand appeal. It was always going to be based on the book, even before the title change. But some people have called it an unfaithful adaptation, and in order to talk about that, we're going to have to talk about the plot of the movie. There will be spoilers, but it is a 24-year-old movie. The first thing we see is a propaganda film about joining the mobile infantry and service guaranteeing citizenship. I'm doing my part! It's these propaganda shorts that give people the impression that this movie is a satire of fascism, and if you switch over to the director's commentary at this exact point in the movie, you'll hear the director and writer say just that. But I can tell you that the movie is, in fact, in our opinion, stating that war makes fascists of us all. That's true. That was the theme. Just to be clear, Paul Verhoeven is the same guy who directed Robocop, and he grew up in the Netherlands during the Nazi occupation of World War II. He's quite obviously an anti-fascist. None of the propaganda segments in Starship Troopers should be viewed as an endorsement of fascism. In fact, it's saying, of course, that this fascist propaganda that is kind of apparent in the movie should be really read, at least uh, that's how we meant it, should be read as something that is not good. So whenever you see something that you think is fascist, you should know that the makers coincide with your opinion, thinking that it is not good. That is not a good statement and this is not good politics. And if you see a black uniform, you should also know bad, bad, bad. So there you go. Within the first two minutes of the director's commentary, we find out that Starship Troopers is an Antifa movie. But like I said, everyone sort of knew that already. The first actual scene of the movie is a flash forward which we're going to skip to keep things chronological. Get out of here now! The first scene we care about takes place during a high school class known as History and Moral Philosophy, taught by Mr. Ratjack. This year we explored the failure of democracy. But well, the social scientists brought our world to the brink of chaos. We talked about the veterans, how they took control and imposed the stability that has lasted for generations since. They never really say how or why or even when these veterans took control. You'll probably have to read the book for that. Just know that they did and now everything is nice, clean and orderly. You, why are only citizens allowed to vote? It's a reward. What the Federation gives you for doing federal service. No. No. Something given has no value. This is really the main takeaway from the movie. Service guarantees citizenship and only citizens can vote because they have proven that they're willing to put society above themselves. Rico, what's the moral difference, if any, between a civilian and a citizen? A citizen accepts personal responsibility for the safety of the body politic, defending it with his life. A civilian does not. The exact words of the text. So knowing nothing else about what they're voting for or what offices exist, the political system in the movie can best be described as a pure meritocracy. Only people who have earned it can vote. When you vote, you are exercising political authority. You're using force. And force, my friends, is violence. The supreme authority from which all other authority is derived. 
The most important political statement that is in this scene is Redzak saying, where he says that violence is the supreme authority that solves everything. You could, of course, say that that this kind of statements are not so much going back to the Third Reich, I would say. There are much more uh, statements about American politics. I mean, the whole movie is about the United States. All statements are about the United States. Okay, so we're not even five minutes into the movie and it went from a satire on fascism to a movie about American politics. We weren't even at war with anyone in 1997. What is he talking about? The director's commentary was available on the DVD when it first came out in 2002. Anyone who claims to have loved the movie before it was cool probably would have heard that. Right? Especially if they were going to make a video discussing the meaning of the movie. I really don't understand all of the confusion regarding the message of the film when the director has explained it multiple times. Unless these people don't want it to be about America. In the interest of time, we're not going to cover the entire plot. We're just going to cover the relevant points. So there's no reason to leave a comment telling me that I forgot about something. I didn't. I'm just trying to keep things brief. Get me? Nope. That felt weird, definitely not quoting the movie anymore. Anyway, we should probably introduce the main character of our story, Johnny Rico, a high school space football star from Buenos Aires. There's been a lot of speculation over the years as to why they made Rico into a blonde haired blue-eyed Argentinian, since that's not how he's described in the book. The obvious answer is that they were trying to appeal to a mostly American audience. Casper Van Dien, who played Johnny, has offered his own explanation, that many Nazis escaped to South America after World War II and maybe he's a descendant of them. But I'd like to offer an alternative theory. In 1988, a Starship Troopers anime was released in Japan, and they also turned Rico into a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Argentinian. They even made him a football star. What an oddly specific thing to copy. He's joined by the quarterback of the team, Dizzy Flores, and his best friend Carl Jenkins, a psychic with the best pet ever. Go bug mom, Cyrano. I've never heard a ferret make noises like that, but okay. The B-plot of the movie follows Rico's girlfriend, Carmen Ibanez, a math genius who dreams of joining the military to be a pilot. On graduation night, they attend a school dance, and if you pay attention to the lyrics of the song, you can figure out when this movie takes place. So this takes place about 300 years into the future, at the end of the 23rd century. The next day, Carl and Carmen go to join the Federal Service, and Rico tags along specifically to impress Carmen. She is selected for pilot, Carl gets placed in military intelligence, and Rico is stuck in the mobile infantry. He tells his rich civilian parents and gets disowned before heading off to basic training. Then we're treated to another series of propaganda films. The first one features a bunch of soldiers, uh teaching a gun safety course to kids, even giving them free souvenirs. Next, a murderer, played by writer Ed Neumeyer, is sentenced to death, and the execution is broadcast on TV. But most importantly to the plot, However, Mormon extremists disregarded federal warnings and established Port Joe Smith, deep inside the arachnid quarantine zone. Too late, they realized that Dantana had already been chosen by other colonists, arachnids. Mormon extremists. You might think that's hilarious. When have Mormons ever moved into a desolate wasteland only to find that it was already occupied? Many times, actually. The point is, this is the first altercation between humans and bugs in the movie. We then return to Rico and basic training, where we're introduced to senior drill instructor Career Sergeant Zim. Do you get me? Sir, yes, sir. We see that Dizzy Flores has also joined up to be near Johnny, and he makes a new friend. East Levy. During the infamous shower scene, we're given another glimpse into life under the United Citizen Federation as the group shares why they joined up. One person volunteered so they could get into politics, since you have to be a citizen. Another signed up so she can get a license to have babies, which sounds a little eugenic-y. And Shijumi joins so that the Federation will pay his way through college. I can see how this movie is about America. That sounds familiar. But only the college part. It's not like we've ever restricted reproductive rights or who could get into office. Okay, you know what? It's just a fun alien war movie. Stop trying to make everything so political. We spend some time with Carmen as she learns to fly the Roger Young under Captain Deladier and sends Rico a Dear Johnny laser disc to break up with him. Rico earns command of the squad and then immediately gets someone killed during a live fire training exercise. It's amazing that only one person got killed considering how many people are running around downrange. 
but he's sentenced to administrative punishment, which is just another term for corporal punishment or flogging. Remember, in this world, violence is the supreme authority from which all other authority is derived. Rigo then resigns from the mobile infantry, but as he's leaving, he sees the news that Buenos Aires has been destroyed by a bug meteor, killing his parents so he decides to stay. The Sky Marshal, who functions similarly to a president in this universe, declares war on the bugs. To ensure that human civilization, not insect, dominates this galaxy now and always. Their first move against this existential threat is to invade the arachnid homeworld of Clendathu. Some say the bugs were provoked by the intrusion of humans into their natural habitat, that a live and let live policy is preferable to war with the bugs. Let me tell you something. I'm from Buenos Aires and I say kill them all. Rico and his basic training unit are sent down in the first wave with a lieutenant we've never seen before. We are going in with the first wave. He's more bugs for us to kill. You smash the entire area, you kill anything that has more than two legs, you get me? We get you, sir! Over 20 years later, and this still gets me pumped up, though it is extremely weird that they would send a unit straight out of basic training together with a new leader in the first wave. Honestly, the action scenes in this movie are great, and the CG still holds up remarkably well. During this battle, we see that flash forward from the beginning of the movie, but from a different perspective. Get out of here now! The media reporter on the front lines is supposed to be making fun of cable news and their coverage of the Gulf War in 1991. There's even a line earlier where he gives away important information. No one here in the AQZ knows exactly when the invasion of Klandathu will occur, but everyone's talking about it, and the talk says tomorrow. The Battle of Klandathu is a disaster, resulting in 308,563 casualties. The Sky Marshal resigns and is replaced by a woman of color who says, to fight the bug, we must understand the bug. We can ill afford another Klendathu. Typical woke military thinking, am I right? We're then shown a talking head segment featuring a science denier who refuses to believe bugs could be intelligent. Insects yeah, with intelligence? Have you ever met one? I can't believe I am hearing this nonsense. Yo, yo. Brain bugs? Frankly, I find the idea of a bug that thinks offensive. The military regroups and Johnny, Dizzy, and Ace are reassigned to Rat Jack's Roughnecks. That's right, Rat Jack, the teacher from earlier, which doesn't make any sense. There are only two possibilities. One, he rejoined or was called back to service in response to the attack on Buenos Aires, in which case he would be dead. Or two, he rejoined before that, for some reason, and just got lucky. Either way, he's here now and arguably has the best lines in the movie. This is for you new people. I only have one rule. Everyone fights, no one quits. If you don't do your job, I'll shoot you. You get me. During their first engagement with the Roughnecks, Johnny shows off his moves while killing a tanker bug. Nice moves. Where'd you learn how to do that, soldier? Back in school, sir. Don't you remember? I was captain of the team. What team? The space rodeo team? If he's talking about football, what does that have to do with- Anyway, he's promoted to corporal as a result and offers the position of squad leader to Ace, who turns it down. Then, in the same breath, he offers it to Dizzy, who happily accepts. <laughs> Later that night, he and Dizzy have sex, which feels a little inappropriate given the recent changes in the chain of command. The Roughnecks then respond to a distress signal on planet P, only to find out that it was a trap laid by the arachnids. <laughs> Warm it all up! Everything you've got! Come on, you hey! You wanna live forever? The ensuing battle is both epic and unimportant to the plot except that Dizzy Flores and Lieutenant Ratjack are killed. They hold a funeral for Dizzy, where Rico re-answers that question from the beginning. Once, somebody asked me if I knew the difference between a citizen and a civilian. I can tell you now. A citizen has the courage to make the safety of the human race their personal responsibility. Carl then shows up dressed like this, promotes Rico to lieutenant, and sends him back to the planet to capture the brain bug. The Roughnecks are then reinforced with some... fresh faces. We you, sir! Welcome to the Roughnecks. 
Rico's Roughnecks! Up in space, the Roger Young is hit by plasma and slowly breaks apart. During the escape, Captain Deladier gets crushed by a door. What a shame, guess we'll never see her again. Carmen and some guy nobody likes escape the ship and crash on the surface, only to run into the brain bug everyone was looking for. Then they hold hands or something? I don't really know, I've never been able to watch that scene. Rico and Ace save Carmen and escape back to the surface just in time to hear that the brain bug was captured. Carl comes down to get a read on it. It's afraid. It's afraid! During the last inspirational speech between our three heroes, they throw in a twist ending. And it wasn't the mighty fleet, it wasn't some fancy new weapon. It was a drill instructor named Zim who captured a brain. The glory of combat was so great that he demoted himself to private. How inspiring. We're then treated to one last propaganda film. We need soldiers. Soldiers like Private Ace Levy and Lieutenant John Rico. Come on, you ain't you wanna live forever! We need you all. Service guarantees citizenship. They do keep fighting. In fact, there are four sequels that most people have never seen. And even if they have, they never talk about. Would you like to know more? If you think you're psychic, maybe you are. Federal studies are being performed in your community. This is an ad for Nebula. Did you predict that? That's the study. Nebula is a streaming platform built by fellow citizens who have done their service to the algorithm. Along with original series like Working Titles, many of your favorite creators upload exclusive content that can only be found on Nebula. All of my videos are hosted there ad-free, and viewers who watch this one get to see 10 minutes of extra content where I talk about the plot and message of the sequels. It also sees the return of Casper Van Dien as Johnny Rico, who is now a colonel and is kind of playing a parody of himself. Come on, you apes! You wanna live forever? You can get access to Nebula when you also sign up for Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles that you can access across multiple platforms. Want to see a breakdown of what might happen if aliens invade? Check out World War A When Aliens Attack, a documentary featuring a number of well-known scientists giving their predictions. Sign up today by going to curiositystream.com slash knowingbetter. For a limited time, you can get a 26% discount on both Curiosity Stream and Nebula, which is only $14.79 a year. Knowledge guarantees citizenship. Would you like to know more? Everyone's doing their part. Are you? The war effort needs your effort. At work, at home, in your community. Would you like to know more? In 2004, as part of my Army ROTC curriculum, I had to choose a book from a list of military classics to write a report on. Since I was a huge fan of the movie, I chose Starship Troopers. A lot of people say that it promotes fascism, or at the very least, militarism. And in order to talk about that, we're going to have to talk about the plot of the book. So there will be spoilers, but it is a 62-year-old book. Starship Troopers, written by Robert Heinlein in 1959, is a libertarian political manifesto disguised as a military science fiction adventure novel. Think of it like Atlas Shrugged, but in space, and a lot shorter. In the book, all of humanity is united under one world government known as the Terran Federation, where only veterans can vote. They don't really refer to it as citizenship, they call it earning a franchise. After your 18th birthday, everyone, regardless of race, class, or anything else, can volunteer for federal service. After completing a two-year term, you've earned your franchise. The protagonist and narrator of the story is Juan Rico, a Filipino man referred to as Johnny by his friends and Juanito by his parents. We don't actually find out about his ethnicity until the very end. We spend some time in his high school history and moral philosophy class, taught by Mr. Dubois, which sets up the basic premise of this universe. This scene plays out almost exactly as it does in the movie, though they switch out the teacher. The only noticeable differences are when he asks what the city fathers of Carthage would say, and asks what the moral difference is between a soldier and a civilian. Upon graduation, Johnny's best friend Carl decides to join up. Just like the movie, Juan comes from a rich civilian family who views voting as a waste of time 
only parasites who can't make it in the business world volunteer for federal service. But Johnny goes to the recruiting station anyway to lend moral support to his friend. While speaking to a recruiter, they run into a female classmate who is also joining up. Carmen Sita Ibanez. She's immediately accepted as a pilot, and that's pretty much the last we see of her. Since the book only follows Johnny, the entire fleet structure in the movie is borrowed from Star Trek. Steady as she goes, number two. Prepare for warp. Yes, ma'am. Number one, designed for Jupiter orbit. In the book, it's actually called the Space Navy rather than the Fleet. Boats and stuff are referred to as the Wet Navy. Almost all pilots in the Space Navy are women because they have quicker reaction speeds and can handle more G-forces, but also because of masculine morale. Unlike the movie, there are no women in the mobile infantry, so the last thing a male soldier hears before being dropped into combat is a woman wishing him good luck. Carl applies for Starside Research and Development and gets it. After seeing two of his friends volunteer, Johnny decides to join up to see if he'll ever be more than just the boss's son. He tries for pilot too, but doesn't have the math scores. As the recruiter is running down his list of preferences, he starts asking Johnny about his family dog and whether he ever snuck it into the house. One of Johnny's options was the canine core. In this branch, men are psychically and genetically linked to a neo-dog known as a Caleb, who can talk and serve as a forward scout. Johnny didn't have a close relationship with his dog, so he was rejected from that too. The last thing he put on his list of preferences was the mobile infantry, which he never expected he'd end up with and somewhat regrets. But under this system, you can quit even after you've been sworn in. The military and the wider federal service is an all-volunteer force. You can leave at any time. The only penalty is that you can never earn your franchise even if you want to try again. The recruiter tells Juan and Carl that too many people are volunteering and they've had to make up work for people to do, since everyone has a constitutional right to sign up. Even if you're blind or paraplegic, they will find a job for you. After his unsuccessful attempt to discourage Juan and Carl from signing up, they're sworn in on the spot without any ceremony. Here's the entire oath as recited in the book. We're not gonna read the whole thing because, well, look at it. Important things to note though, a term is not less than two years and as much longer as may be required by the needs of the service. Rico is understandably nervous about that statement, as he should be. The modern US military has that same loophole. Those who are caught up in it are said to have been stop-lost. This is why I spent seven years in the military rather than the usual six. You're swearing to uphold and defend the Constitution of the Federation on or off Terra, which is Earth. The oath also makes mention of non-human beings, but only in the context of subjugation. There's nothing about obeying the lawful orders of non-human beings in the previous sentence. Rico is disowned by his parents for enlisting and heads off to basic training at Camp Arthur Curry somewhere in the northern prairies of Canada. We're introduced to his drill instructor, Career Ship Sergeant Zim. The introduction and fight scene play out similarly to the movie, except that Shijumi fights him and actually holds his own. The knife scene also happens, but he doesn't throw it through anybody's hand. One person named Hendrik joins specifically to get into politics, but he gets into a fight with Zim and goes through the fastest court-martial I've ever seen. He's punished with 10 lashes and a bad conduct discharge. Rico actually fainted during the punishment and considers resigning multiple times, but at his lowest point, he receives a letter from his former teacher, Mr. Dubois. You are now going through the hardest part of your service. Not the hardest physically, but the hardest spiritually. So perhaps you'll permit an older comrade to lend you the words, since it often helps to have discreet words. Simply this, the noblest fate that a man can endure is to place his own mortal body between his loved home and the war's desolation. After reading the letter, Rico has a renewed sense of purpose and begins reminiscing about the things he learned in history and moral philosophy. Maybe that class was more useful than he remembered. Of course, the Marxian theory of value is ridiculous. All the work one cares to add will not turn a mud pie into an apple tart. It remains a mud pie, value zero. By corollary, unskillful work can easily subtract value. An untalented cook can turn wholesome dough and fresh green apples, valuable already, into an inedible mess, value zero. Conversely, a great chef can fashion of those same material a confection of greater value than a commonplace apple tart, with no more effort than an ordinary cook uses to prepare an ordinary sweet. These kitchen illustrations demolish the Marxian theory of value, 
the fallacy from which the entire magnificent fraud of communism derives. The Marxian theory of value, otherwise known as the labor theory of value, states that the value of a produced economic good can be measured objectively by the average number of labor hours required to produce it. Mr. Dubois, the Federation, and we can assume Heinlein himself, believe in the utility theory of value. This is the theory that value is solely based on how much use a person can get out of a product making this theory relative to each individual. The book specifically states that market value is a fiction, merely a guess at the average of personal values. There is an old song which asserts, the best things in life are free. Not true, utterly false. This was the tragic fallacy which brought on the decadence and collapse of the democracies of the 20th century. Those noble experiments failed because the people had been led to believe that they could simply vote for whatever they wanted and get it, without toil, without sweat, without tears. This novel takes place 700 years into the future. What caused the collapse of democracy? For years, the North American Republic was plagued with high crime rates mostly thanks to roving gangs of juvenile delinquents. Why were there so many juvenile delinquents? Because child psychologists and social workers spread the idea that spanking caused permanent psychic damage to a child. So corporal punishment was forbidden by law. The tragic wrongness of what those well-meaning people did, contrasted with what they thought they were doing, goes very deep. They had no scientific theory of morals. They did have a theory of morals, and they tried to live by it, but their theory was wrong. You see, they assumed man has a moral instinct. Man has no moral instinct. He is not born with moral sense. We acquire moral sense when we do through training, experience, and hard sweat of the mind. These unfortunate juvenile criminals were born with none, and they had no chance to acquire any. Their experiences did not permit it. This lawless period where people were afraid to go out at night for fear of being mugged was referred to as the Terror. In 1987, a war broke out between the Russo-Anglo-American Alliance and the Chinese hegemony. This Third World War lasted over a hundred years and ended in a stalemate with the Treaty of New Delhi which completely ignored the issue of prisoners of war. Many of them were just turned loose and had to find their own way home during another lawless period known as the Disorders. The veterans of this war felt that their government had failed them, and around the year 2130, a group in Aberdeen, Scotland decided to turn vigilante and solve the crime problem themselves. Then they decided that only other veterans could join their group. Eventually, those vigilante veterans spread across the globe, and formed the Terran Federation on October 19, 2132. We have such a theory now. We can solve any moral problem on any level. Self-interest, love of family, duty to country, responsibility toward the human race. We are even developing an exact ethic for extra-human relations. In the Terran Federation, both corporal and capital punishment are common. Punishments have to be cruel and unusual, otherwise you won't learn anything from it. You have no unalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are empty platitudes. How can anyone guarantee your right to life? They can't cure cancer, and they can't stop you from bleeding out. The best they can do is just allow you to continue living. You also have no right to liberty. The guy who wrote that line hundreds of years ago also said that you must periodically renew that purchase with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It's not unalienable. And the pursuit of happiness is just a joke. Whether you're a king in a palace or a thief in a dungeon, how can anyone stop you from pursuing an emotion inside your own head? The Terran Federation does not care about your rights. Juvenile delinquent is a contradiction in terms. Delinquent means failing in duty, but duty is an adult virtue. Indeed, a juvenile becomes an adult when, and only when, he acquires a knowledge of duty and embraces it. There never was, and cannot be, a juvenile delinquent. The junior hoodlums who roamed the streets were symptoms of a greater sickness. Their citizens glorified their mythology of rights and neglected their duties. About halfway through basic training, Rigo starts learning how to use the power suits, which are as vital to the mobile infantry as Neo dogs are to the Canine Corps. It gives you greater endurance, more firepower, and less vulnerability. The Marauder suit weighs 2,000 pounds and makes you look like a mechanical gorilla. 
You don't control the suit though, you just wear it. It apparently works through negative feedback. Every suit is capable of using jets to jump into the air and float for a few seconds. You can even double jump if necessary. Because of that, troopers use the phrase on the bounce incessantly. See on the bounce, trooper. On the bounce! While training with the suits during a simulated nighttime combat exercise, Rico decides to flip up his goggles to see his surroundings. He gets caught by Zim and is sentenced to five lashes as administrative punishment. Unlike the movie, Johnny is publicly flogged for gross negligence which would have resulted in the death of a teammate by cheating in a simulated combat environment. Zim does give him something to bite down on though, which is nice. The final test at boot camp involves being dropped into the Canadian Rockies with no clothing or supplies. It's on you to forage and find your way back. Two recruits die during that exercise. In fact, of the 2009 people who began basic training at Arthur Curry, only 187 graduated. 14 recruits died, one was executed, and the rest resigned or transferred. By the time Rico graduated, his initial hesitation over joining the mobile infantry was replaced with pride over having made it through this elite, difficult training. The mobile infantry is the army. All the others are either button pushers or professors, along merely to hand us the saw. We do the work. His first combat unit is known as Willie's Wildcats aboard the Valley Forge. That random lieutenant he was assigned to in the movie was supposed to be Lieutenant Willie. Every unit is named after the officer in charge. While underway, they receive the news that Buenos Aires had been destroyed, or as they say in the book, smeared. I suppose I noticed the destruction of BA much less than most civilians did. We were already a couple of parsecs away under Cherenkov Drive, and the news didn't reach us until we got it from another ship after we came out of drive. I remember thinking, gosh, that's terrible, and feeling sorry for the one Porteño on the ship. But BA wasn't my home, and Terra was a long way off, and I was very busy, as the attack on Klandathu, the bug's home planet, was mounted immediately after that. That's right. In the book, Juan Rico is not from Buenos Aires. Aside from saying he's Filipino, we're never actually told where he's from. And the bugs did not use a meteor. The bugs in the book are actually called pseudo-arachnids, and they have spaceships, missiles, landmines, and beam laser weapons. They even talk, though it's a language humans don't understand. The only thing the movie borrowed was the caste system. There are workers who are completely incapable of fighting, soldiers who are incapable of doing anything but fighting, and then there are brains and queens who do all of the thinking and reproducing. The bugs are not like us. The pseudoarachnids aren't even like spiders. They are arthropods who happen to look like a madman's conception of a giant intelligent spider. But their organization, psychological and economic, is more like that of ants or termites. They are communal entities, the ultimate dictatorship of the hive. Every time we killed a thousand bugs at a cost of one MI, it was a net victory for the bugs. We were learning, expensively, just how efficient a total communism can be when used by a people actually adapted to it by evolution. The bug commissars didn't care any more about expending soldiers than we cared about expending ammo. Operation Bug House was the invasion of Klendathu and happened to be Rico's first combat engagement. It was a disaster, lasting all of five pages. Only half of Willie's Wildcats dropped down to the surface in pods before the Valley Forge collided with another ship and was destroyed. By the time the retreat was sounded, Rico's unit had lost 80% of its troopers. Unlike the movie, General Deans was fighting on the ground and was killed since the rule in the mobile infantry is everyone fights, everyone works. Even the chaplains and cooks fight. Six weeks later, Rico is reassigned to Rat Jack's Roughnecks aboard the Roger Young, piloted by Captain Deladrier. The Roger Young is a corvette transport that can only carry one platoon. After the Battle of Klandathu, the powers that be decided to switch to smaller smash and run missions until they could rebuild their strength. It's during one of these minor drops that Lieutenant Ratjack dies. After receiving a letter from his aunt, Rico learns that his mother was in Buenos Aires during the attack and was killed. No word on his father. The bugs found the location of Terra through another alien race known as the Skinnies. These were completely cut out of the movie, but they make an appearance in the TV show and look like your run-of-the-mill gray aliens. The Roughnecks' next mission is to punish these geezers. The harassment campaign against the Skinnies is actually the first chapter of the book, but I wanted to keep things chronological. So if you see any comments about how I must not have read the book because I forgot about the opening battle, 
you'll know that they didn't actually watch the whole thing. The bugs laid a trap for us, didn't they? Elegant proof of intelligence, isn't it? The fight against the skinnies is both methodical and boring, since they were ordered to cause as much property damage as possible while killing as few people as possible. The idea was to punish the skinnies, not destroy them. During this battle, Dizzy Flores, who is a man in the book, buys the farm which is another phrase troopers use constantly. Because of the various vacancies, Rico is promoted to corporal. Shortly after their raid, the skinnies switch sides and begin providing the Federation with intelligence on the bugs. They're the only reason we know about brains and queens. No human had ever seen one. As assistant section leader, Rico found himself in command of more senior troopers like Ace, who resented that fact. They get into a fight in the shower and agree to mutually respect each other. The Roger Young heads back to Sanctuary, a secret planet which serves as a forward military base and an r, &R station. Everything related to the war is routed through this planet. Shortly afterwards, Ace convinces Rico to go career and try for officer candidate school which he does. Going career is a 20-year commitment that you cannot quit. As an additional caveat, as long as you're in service, you cannot vote. That's a privilege reserved for those who have completed their time, whether that was a two-year term or a 20-year career. Johnny is promoted to career sergeant just before his detachment to OCS, and when he lands on the planet to go to school, he runs into his father, who is now a corporal in the mobile infantry on his way to join the Roughnecks. He apparently always knew that he should join up, but didn't feel inspired to do so until he saw Juanito do it. I'm sure his wife dying had something to do with it too. To double up on the chance encounters from the past, he gets a visit from now Ensign Carmen Sita. She's a pilot under instruction who has shaved her head, because apparently you don't want hair floating around in zero gravity. She delivers the news that his best friend Carl was killed during a bug attack on a research station on Pluto. Around this same time, San Francisco is also destroyed by the bugs. During OCS, Juan has to retake his history and moral philosophy class because that course is only offered on Terra and more Colonials join up to serve than those from Earth. For those keeping track, this is the third civics class we have to sit through. This one seems to be a little more advanced than the previous, and is taught by a blind man named Major Reed. Mr. Salomon, can you give me a reason why the franchise is today limited to discharged veterans? Uh, because they are picked men, sir. Smarter. Servicemen are not brighter than civilians. In many cases, civilians are much more intelligent. That was the sliver of justification underlying the attempted coup d'etat just before the Treaty of New Delhi. The so-called revolt of the scientists. Let the intelligent elite run things and you'll have utopia. It fell flat on its foolish face, of course. Apparently, near the end of the war between the Russo-Anglo-American alliance and the Chinese hegemony, the scientists of the world thought that they could run things better than the government. But they never got the chance. Their coup d'etat failed. Instead, in the chaos that followed the armistice, we got a military aristocracy which morphed into a constitutional democracy with an extremely selective franchise. Under our system, every voter and office holder is a man who has demonstrated through voluntary and difficult service that he places the welfare of the group ahead of personal advantage. He may fail in wisdom, he may lapse in civic virtue, but his average performance is enormously better than that of any other class of rulers in history. They justify this restrictive franchise by saying that literally every system of government seeks to limit voting power to those who are believed to be the wisest. Even the so-called unlimited democracies excluded people. Our system works quite well. Many complain, but none rebel. Personal freedom for all is greatest in history. Laws are few, taxes are low, living standards are as high as productivity permits. Crime is at its lowest ebb. That sounds great, but I feel like it's important to remember that this is a work of fiction. Like Atlas Shrugged, this entire system is only possible because of the inciting incident that the end of spanking led to a rise in crime. And of course, veterans being forgotten after World War III. It's one thing to suggest a new political system, but Writing an entire fictional universe to prove that your system would work better than the current system is something else entirely. Can anyone define why there has never been a revolution against our system, despite the fact that every government in history has had such, despite the notorious fact that complaints are loud and unceasing? The unlimited democracies were unstable because their citizens were not responsible for the fashion in which they exerted their sovereign authority. 
Since Sovereign Franchise is the ultimate in human authority, we ensure that all who wield it accept the ultimate in social responsibility. We require each person who wishes to exert control over the state to wager his own life and lose it if need be to save the life of the state. Well, that doesn't sound like a democracy or an aristocracy. That sounds like something else. As the final test in OCS, Rico is given the temporary rank of third lieutenant and is sent to a combat unit to get some leadership experience. Every officer candidate must be a trained trooper and a veteran of combat. Rico is assigned as a platoon leader in Blackie's Blackguards, a rump battalion aboard the regimental transport Tours. Big ships are named after battles, small ships are named after people. They play a role in Operation Royalty on Planet P, which was a campaign designed to capture the royal castes of bugs. Not to learn how they think, but in the hopes of negotiating a prisoner exchange. Through the skinnies, they learn that the bugs do take prisoners, and have been keeping them all on Clendathu to prevent the Federation from bombing it into oblivion. The Navy had already bombarded the surface of Planet P. The mobile infantry was sent down to hold it and wait for the arachnids to come up on their own, and once all of the warriors were dead, go down into the holes and find royalty. The climactic battle of the book lasts all of nine pages. Blink and you'll miss it. Rico actually plays a very small role, spending most of his time dealing with a diversion. The real hero is his platoon sergeant, Zim, who captures a brain. They actually capture six brains during this operation. The final chapter of the book shows Lieutenant Juan Rico, in command of Rico's Roughnecks, about to invade Clendathu for a second time to rescue those prisoners. And just for good measure, he's joined by his platoon sergeant, who happens to be his father. Rather famously, Paul Verhoeven only read the first two chapters of the book and found it incredibly boring. The writer Ed Neumeyer filled him in on the necessary details. Because of that, many people have described the movie as an unfaithful adaptation, and they've been talking about rebooting the franchise ever since the first one came out. But I'm not sure you'd actually enjoy it if they did that. All the stuff you like was invented by the movie, whether it's the design of the bugs, the memorable helmets and uniforms, or all of the quotable lines. Service guarantees citizenship. I'm doing my part. Would you like to know more? Come on, you ape! You wanna live forever! None of those are in the book. That ape's line is referenced on the first page of chapter one and is credited to an unknown platoon sergeant but no character actually says it. The book doesn't have any of those fun propaganda films. Instead, we spend most of our time in class. In terms of the plot, the book and the movie should be viewed as completely separate pieces of media. Aside from sharing a few names, they have very little in common. But in terms of the political message, they were pretty much spot on. Since the book and the movie came out four decades apart, they were interpreted very differently. Would you like to know more? Every day, federal scientists are looking for new ways to kill bugs. The only good bug is a dead bug. Your basic arachnid warrior- Whoa, whoa, wait. You do know that bugs and arachnids are two completely different things, right? Would you like to know more? Robert A. Heinlein was born in 1907 in Butler, Missouri. His family had a long tradition of fighting in every single American war, so it came as no surprise when he was accepted into the Naval Academy in 1925. His brother was a major general in the Army and eventually the Air Force. Heinlein spent some time as a radio communications officer on an aircraft carrier and then a gunnery officer on a destroyer earning the rank of lieutenant. But in 1934, he was medically discharged for having tuberculosis. After leaving the Navy, Heinlein turned his attention to politics and worked on Upton Sinclair's unsuccessful bid for governor of California that same year. In 1938, he ran for a California assembly seat and lost. Since this was right in the middle of the Great Depression, he actually ran as a left-wing socialist candidate on the Democratic ticket. Isaac Asimov described Heinlein as a flaming liberal. After his somewhat short political career, Heinlein turned to writing and sold his first short story, known as Lifeline, to astounding science fiction in 1939. Science fiction was still a fairly new genre and was sometimes called future history or speculative fiction. Along with Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke, 
Heinlein was labeled as one of the big three science fiction writers and continued to write short stories until 1941. During World War II, he was employed as an aeronautical engineer at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. The end of the war, and more specifically the beginning of the Atomic Age, the Cold War, and eventually the Space Race, drastically changed the direction of his fiction and his politics. He publicly declared that he was no longer a Democrat in 1954. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, Heinlein became convinced that a strong one-world government was the only way to ensure humanity's survival into the future, and he incorporated that belief into his novels when he turned back to writing. He often speculated on how scientific progress would shape the future of politics and things like race, sex, and religion. He also became a self-identified libertarian. His work began to lean more conservative and anti-communist, emphasizing individual liberty, self-reliance, and one's obligation to society. In the decade after World War II, he wrote dozens of short stories and novels. But then, in 1958, Heinlein was flipping through the newspaper and saw a full-page ad demanding that Eisenhower cease all nuclear tests. It was paid for by the National Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy. Heinlein stopped working on what would eventually become A Stranger in a Strange Land and founded the Patrick Henry League. They printed a full-page ad in favor of nuclear testing and eventually supported the Barry Goldwater campaign. But much more famously, he spent a few weeks writing a book which shared those same beliefs, originally a two-part serial titled Starship Soldier. It was reprinted in 1959 as a standalone novel and retitled Starship Troopers. The book wasn't written as a fun exploration of how technology would influence society. It was a reaction to calls for nuclear disarmament. It was a political blueprint for America to follow with a science fiction veneer. Starship Troopers won the Hugo Award for Best Novel in 1960, but wasn't without its critics. One person described it as a book where civics info dumps far outweigh the thin and tensionless combat scenes. But most of the criticisms regarded its themes and politics. Many viewed it as promoting fascism or militarism. Fascism is one of those slippery words that means different things to different people. In a nutshell, under fascism, everyone exists to serve the state, which exerts tight control over the economy and moral direction of society. Mussolini is the prime example of fascism. He's the origin of the word. Most people think of Hitler, and while he was a fascist, he was also an ethno-nationalist. It's possible to be two things. Some have even argued that Stalin was a fascist on top of being a communist. Fascism is the authoritarian control over who gets what rights and privileges, and whether the state exists to serve the people, or the people exist to serve the state. Does the Terran Federation fit that description? Kind of. The immediate counterargument to what I just said is that since the people get to vote, they're exerting power over the state. But only a select number of people get to exert that power. That alone makes it an aristocracy, which we typically associate with the time of kings and queens. So let's put it in more modern terms. Citizens who have earned their franchise are party members. In order to participate in the system, people must first be willing to fight for and die for that system. Anyone who doesn't agree with the state isn't going to join up and thus doesn't have a say in changing it. You could argue that the citizens and veterans earned their power through merit, but Literally every ruling class in history has claimed that. You'd have to assume that the veterans are benevolent, which they're not. The Terran Federation definitely has some version of democratic voting, but it's so limited that it's best described as exclusionary. It may not be the full-blown dictionary definition of fascism, but it is close. Militarism is the idea that violent conflict between societies is both inevitable and necessary for progress. So a country should always be prepared with a strong military even in peacetime. This is paired with the social Darwinist theory that survival is based on strength, and ultimately, violence can be used to solve most conflicts. I don't think anybody can seriously argue that Starship Troopers doesn't promote these themes. Peace is a condition in which no civilian pays any attention to military casualties which do not achieve page one lead story prominence. But if there ever was a time in history when peace meant that there was no fighting going on, I have been unable to find out about it. When I reported to my first outfit, the fighting had been going on for several years. Everything up to then and still later were incidents, patrols, or police actions. Again, the counter-argument here is obvious. They were facing an existential threat. They obviously needed a strong military. But this is a work of fiction. He could have set this whenever he wanted. 
He chose war. He saw a conflict between America and the Chinese as inevitable, and worried that we were becoming too soft. And not just in the nuclear arms race. He thought the next generation of American children were too spoiled and undisciplined, which is hilarious when you realize that he's talking about the baby boomers. So he wrote a book where he advocated for spanking and corporal punishment. He thought the moral and military decline of the United States would pave the way for swarming hordes of Chinese to invade. If you haven't figured this out yet, the bugs were a metaphor for communism. There is very little interpersonal human conflict in the book. Racism, nationalism, and even religion seem to be things of the past. Instead, humans just subjugate and go to war with aliens. Starship Troopers is a coming-of-age story that takes place under a near-constant state of war. It glorifies military service and promotes duty to country. You could say it's egalitarian in its approach, since everyone, including women, are encouraged to serve, but the book includes several uncomfortable love letters to the mere concept of girls. Girls are simply wonderful. Just to stand on a corner and watch them going past is delightful. They don't walk. I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's much more complex and utterly delightful. They don't move just their feet. Everything moves and in different directions, and all of it graceful. The idea that men are the only ones who fight on the ground and women only serve as pilots, or decoration, just preserves the hyper-masculine image of the military. Am I saying that we need more female mobile infantry? No. I'm saying that maybe we need to stop perpetuating the idea that the only way to become a man is through aggressive violence. Remember, Heinlein was medically discharged before World War II. He didn't go through the rigors of combat or a military rite of passage. He just wants you to. Not only that, he wants you to see it as your obligation. All of the service members in Starship Troopers are volunteers, which he was immediately criticized for because, at the time, that's just not how the military worked. The draft was in effect until 1973. Many have argued that the book doesn't show the reality of military life, since everyone is tough and competent. There are no stupid decisions or months of doing nothing. In 1974, Joe Haldeman wrote a military science fiction novel titled The Forever War, which many people have described as a response to Starship Troopers. Haldeman has denied that, but we're going to talk about it anyway. I'm not going to give away too much of the plot because I do think it's a good book and I highly recommend that you read it. We're just going to talk about the premise. In 1967, Haldeman graduated from college with degrees in physics and astronomy and was immediately drafted by the US Army as a combat engineer and sent to Vietnam. He was ideologically opposed to the war and even considered applying as a conscientious objector. My pacifism was close closely reasoned and, I thought, deeply felt. But I was a post-World War II American male who had grown up on John Wayne movies and G.I. Joe comics, and there was something in me that deeply wanted to prove that I could soldier. Hmm, I wonder if books like Starship Troopers left a similar impression. The Forever War follows William Mandela, a physicist who is drafted by the United Nations Exploratory Force and sent to fight on the other side of the galaxy. Humanity is at war with an alien species from the constellation Taurus. When he arrives on that distant planet, they have no idea what the Taurans actually look like and end up slaughtering any alien species they come across. The combat in this book is definitely not tensionless. He's only drafted for a two-year term, and it takes several months to travel to and from the front through a series of wormholes. Thanks to time dilation, the two years he experienced were actually two decades on Earth. He comes home to a vaguely familiar society. All of his friends and most of his family are gone or different, and beliefs which were on the fringe when he left are now mainstream. He has so much trouble adapting to this new normal that he gives up and voluntarily goes back to war. The book was based on Haldeman's own experiences in Vietnam, and having been deployed to Iraq myself, I identify with this story a lot more than any other. The Forever War won the Nebula Award in 1975 and the Hugo Award in 1976. Heinlein personally congratulated Haldeman on the award, reportedly saying that it may be the best future war story he ever read. The same year Haldeman wrote his book, Heinlein was named the first science fiction writer's grand master. In 1980, Heinlein defended his book with his expanded universe writings, saying that federal service doesn't have to be in the military, and 95% of citizens earn their vote through civil service. But none of that is in Starship Troopers. All of the civics lessons regard service as being fundamentally combat-oriented, and none of the characters even discuss becoming a doctor or a teacher. This is like declaring that Dumbledore is gay years after 
after the fact. Heinlein was a member of the Citizens Advisory Council on National Space Policy and helped Reagan draft his Star Wars Missile Defense Program in 1983. That same year, he became the first recipient of the Libertarian Futurist Society's Prometheus Hall of Fame Award. Robert Heinlein died of emphysema and heart failure in 1988, and the movie rights were sold by his estate a few years later. Would you like to know more? A sock thief was captured this morning and tried today. Guilty. Sentence, death. Execution, tonight at 6. All net, all channels. Would you like to know more? Starship Troopers is without a doubt the most influential book in the genre of science fiction. It popularized the idea of power armor and the trope of space marines. James Cameron made every cast member who played a colonial marine in the 1986 movie Aliens read Heinlein's book in preparation for the role. The movie itself is littered with references to Starship Troopers. Is this going to be a stand-up fight, sir, or another bug hunt? Here's the cover art for the 1987 edition of Starship Troopers. And here's the cover art for the video game Fallout 3. If you don't see a resemblance, I don't know what to tell you. The video game Halo borrows multiple concepts from the book. The mobile infantry drop pods were the inspiration behind ODSTs, and the planet Reach functions the same way as Sanctuary. The Zerg from StarCraft are based on the Arachnids. Their societal structure comes from the book, while their design comes from the movie. Same goes for the Terran Marines and Marauders. Despite how obviously influential Starship Troopers was in the realm of science fiction, the movie kind of flopped when it was released in 1997. Their goal was to satirize all of the things the book was accused of being. Heinlein wrote the book as a way of saying, hey, America, you're looking kind of weak. You should do this. While the movie was saying, hey, America, look how ridiculous this is. Don't do it. But that message was lost on a lot of people. Us millennials have an excuse, at least. We were too young to understand the politics. I grew up thinking Robocop was just a movie about a cyborg policeman. So before I say anything else, let me make this clear. Liking the movie, making memes about it, and even quoting it does not make you a fascist. Wanting its exclusionary political system does. The Terran Federation adopted their system of limited franchise in reaction to a series of specific fictional events. But there are some people who want to do it preemptively because it sounds cool. They justify the militaristic society of Starship Troopers by correctly pointing out that they're facing an existential alien threat. And sure, if aliens were to destroy one of our cities with a meteor, I'd probably agree. But let's not forget that in the movie, the humans kind of started it by moving into arachnid territory and they already had a powerful military, which didn't deter anything. Once the bugs retaliated, though, that's all we remembered. I'm from Buenos Aires, and I say kill them all! Nobody really understood the satire of the movie because we weren't really at war with anyone when it came out. But then 9-11 happened, and we unironically became Starship Troopers. We vowed to never forget while completely forgetting all of the incidents and police actions that led to that point. We invaded their home, and when that didn't work, the countries outlying their home one by one. Everyone had to do their part and support the troops, who were fighting the existential threat of terrorism. We didn't call them bugs, we had other names. In fact, we've always had other names, because we've always been fighting an existential threat that's required us to maintain a strong all-volunteer military just in case. Starship Troopers was written to advocate for that strength against communism. Whether it was fascism before, terrorism after, or whatever they come up with next, there will always be a reason to send the poorest among us to die for the state if need be. That classist argument was in the movie, but it was cut. My dad's home today. What's his problem? He treats me like I'm a criminal. It's not you, it's your parents. They're not citizens. They have money, so they don't need to be citizens. We never see civilian life in detail. The only example we get are Johnny's parents, who seem to be doing pretty all right for themselves. But we never actually see anyone vote. The few adult citizens we see, who by definition have to be veterans, are maimed in some way. I'm not sure this system is the utopia you think it is. We've always had a limited franchise in this country. At first, only white male landowners could participate. We've slowly lifted those restrictions, but still, only citizens can vote. We have an all-volunteer military now. We've even let women into the infantry. 
how progressive, and everyone reveres national service, at least according to their bumper stickers. But having an all-volunteer military allows society to ignore everything they do during peacetime and not think twice about sending them off to war. Because hey, nobody forced them to sign up. Maybe we need to heed the warning of our favorite alien war movie. Because we already live in Starship Troopers, and I'm not sure this system is something we should actually continue. Would you like to know more? Wow, look at all the people who helped me make this video. I'd like to give a shout out to my newest Golden Fork patron, Alessandro. If you'd like to add your name to this list of troopers, head on over to patreon.com slash knowingbetter, or for a one-time donation, paypal.me slash knowingbetter. Don't forget to serve that subscribe button or the join button if you're a true citizen. Check out the merch at knowingbetter.tv, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and join us on the subreddit.